I'm Chief Phil Stittleberg, and I'm Chief of the Lafarge Fire Department. So, a little, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your childhood. I grew up on a small dairy farm over in Richland County. I attended the uh, University of Wisconsin and uh, took a bachelor's degree in political science in 1969, and then went on to UW Law School and graduated in 1972, and came to Lafarge and started practicing law there, and I've been there ever since. What made you come back to Lafarge after you had, did you know you'd always wanted to live here? I knew that I wanted to return to this general area, and as luck would have it, uh, as I was uh, getting ready to graduate, the, attorney, the previous attorney in Lafarge was just retiring. So an opening developed at just uh, exactly the right moment for me. Who, who is in your family, that immediate family? Uh, I have uh, my mother still alive. She is 95 and still lives on the home farm. Uh, my father passed away some years ago. I have a brother who lives on the farm next to my mother's and a uh, sister who lives in Tennessee. What about any key um, moments in your life that were impactful for you in giving you direction on what you wanted to do? Well, I'd had an interest in law school probably since I was in grade school. I'd always been interested just in advocacy and the ability to influence policy and, and uh, uh, have direction over how things might develop and that always intrigued me. So uh, that was the course I chose. What about when you came back to Lafarge to practice law? Did it, did it reaffirm that you picked the right field of study? Well, it did, and initially it was just a general practice when I started in 72, but in January of 74, I was appointed as assistant district attorney, uh, which was a half-time position, and it was a position that I held until uh, January of 2010. So for that 36 years, I had a um, half-time private practice and a uh, half-time prosecutor. And I uh, really, uh, really enjoyed the combination of those. I enjoy working in law enforcement. It's a very fulfilling uh, profession. And at the same time, was able to have the personal interaction with uh, local people that the private practice provided me. How, how was it being the assistant district attorney? Because there you don't necessarily get to choose your cases that you work on. That, that's true, um, and on occasion, because we live in a small county, we would have situations where there was something I couldn't prosecute because I had some prior, uh, prior contact with that person or I represented them in some other way. But on the other hand, it also, uh, by virtue of my uh, affiliation with the fire service, provides some very interesting opportunities too. It was not terribly uncommon where I would respond uh, to an accident call and uh, engage in the activities of extrication and, and uh, packaging and shipping the patient, uh, later to find out that they were intoxicated and then I would let it prosecute them. So I get to work both professions. Was there any point of inspiration that you can remember, either a um, particular person or a particular event that you felt like was really inspiring to your mission? Well, there was an event that actually kind of directed my entire life, I think. Um, when I was in, uh, at the university. Uh, I was living uh, uh, in an old house just on University Avenue. This was in the mid-60s and uh, there was a fire in a structure directly across University Avenue from, from my house. Pretty, pretty significant fire in Chris. This was uh, university campus in the 60s so fires were not all that uncommon at that time. But uh, I remember the fire department arriving and I, I thought for sure this building had to burn down. It, it just, there was so much fire. And they went in and put this fire out in 15 minutes. And I couldn't believe how they had done what they did. And it really generated an interest uh, in the fire service. Okay, that was during undergrad. Now if we fast forward about four years, I'm in my second year of law school. And it's the fall of that semester and I'm looking for a job. Uh, one morning a friend of mine uh, came in, a classmate came in and sat down next to me. And he slid a, a wad ad that he'd cut out over to me and it said that the uh, city of Monona was hiring uh, firefighters. So I went and applied for the job of firefighter and got that job. And it was an ideal job uh, for a student. Um, at that time Monona was, and I think still is, a what we call a combination department. In other words, it has 
volunteers and career or paid. Uh, at, uh, at that time, why the only paid cadre was, was four people. They were called night drivers. Uh, and uh, the night drivers would live in at night, take the calls, take the uh, uh, engine out to the call, and then everyone else would respond directly. It was a great job. You'd work every fourth night from 5 p.m. till 7 a.m. So you'd get there at uh, uh, 5 p.m. You'd have a couple hours work. Uh, policing up the trucks, policing up the station, checking the radios, things like that. And then, um, because you had living quarters, obviously, you could, you could study. So you'd get to do your homework. And if you didn't have a real busy night, you got a good night's sleep and, and got up the next morning and went, uh, went back, to, back to school. Uh, at the time, I didn't have a car. And uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, the lady who is now my wife uh, worked near where I lived. So when she left work at the end of the day, she would pick me up take me to the station that night. She would then go home, pick me up at the station the next morning on her way back to work and drop me off at home. So it was an ideal arrangement and uh, that was my entry into the end of the fire service. And that's when you knew you wanted to do work with the... It absolutely was, although at that time of course I was, I was paid, but uh, then when I graduated and moved to Lafarge, the very first thing I did was uh, join the fire department. And tell me about that experience. Here it's all volunteer based. How does that change service levels or commitment or that type of... I don't see a huge change in anything other than paycheck. In other words, you know, the, the training is required, I think the commitment is the same. Uh, the difference is uh, our form of pay is different. Uh, the career service gets a paycheck. Uh, what I love to tell people is, uh, for us, payday is thank you. Uh, we don't get a check. But when you, you, know, you cut somebody's kid out of a car, or you, know, you save somebody's house, and they come up to you and say, I, I want to thank you for, for saving my child's life, or, or for saving everything I own in the world that, that really is important, I want to thank you for that. That's payday. You've been paid. Uh, sometimes you have to listen for you know, payday. Sometimes you have to listen for thank you. It isn't quite as obvious as thank you, but um, when people introduce you as a firefighter, and there's pride in their voice in saying that. There's a thank you in there. Or, um, you know, when you go to your budget hearing, and in our small communities, money is tight. I mean, it simply is. This is not a rich community. And uh, so you know that, that it's tough to raise money. And you present your budget, and, and instead of uh, having to nickel dime about it, they say, yes, you know, we'll approve it. That's thank you. That's you're doing a good job. Thank you for what you do. Yeah, I think I didn't know how much firefighters did until I came here and had more respect instead of it just being a job in Madison. It was, it was an extracurricular commitment. You know, it was someone taking, working full time and then volunteering on the fire department. Yeah. So what does it look like being a volunteer firefighter in this area? What, what's involved in that role? Well, there's quite a bit of initial training obviously involved. Uh, so that takes, that takes quite a bit of time, uh, probably a year uh, of training by the time you get to get through all of it to get up to up to speed at, at entry uh, at entry level. Um, obviously you got the the commitment to the continuing training and and uh, of course the commitment to, to the emergency calls and one of the challenges I think that's kind of unique in, in uh, small areas not just our area but small areas generally in the fire service uh, is the is the challenge presented by the fact that an awful lot of the responses you're going to make are to people you know. Um, and that sometimes is hard. Uh, not all outcomes are happy. And uh, so that's, that can be very stressful. We, we've had those situations where um, relatives of, you know, of our people that are responding or, or the people that are involved in the, in the fire or in the accident. And uh, so there's a, there's a higher level of stress, I think, that we see in the more rural communities uh, because of that relationship. How much time is involved in volunteering? Like, what does a call look like? Well, and of course, this sounds like kind of a silly answer because obviously it's going to be determined by the nature of the call or the size of the call, of course. But just, just as a general proposition, um, if it's an auto accident, uh, you're probably looking at two to three hours. So from the time of page, uh, the time you go, do your job, uh, the parts people forget, of course, is you have to go back and uh, put all the equipment back in working order. So there's a lot of cleanup and, and restoring things and checking things over again once we get back from the call. So if you're looking at an, you know, at an accident call, probably uh, two to three hours. 
If you look at a wildland fire call, some of those can take quite a while. Um, a large structure call, um, for instance, the Organic Valley uh, fire that occurred a few years ago, um, I think that fire came at about 4.30 p.m. and I think we cleared at about 10 a.m. the following day. So some of them could be, it could be terribly long. Um, storm spotter, you know, probably is going to take half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour until the storm front passes. So it really depends if it's a search and rescue, some of those can be really quite lengthy. Uh, we get to some of those, uh, seems like almost every year with uh, campers on the Kickapoo or canoeists on the Kickapoo when uh, there's a storm coming in or uh, canoeists just haven't uh, shown up where they're supposed to show up and uh, so we have to go find them. Tell me about the storm spotter. What is that? We get uh, alerts through, the, through dispatch, which is in turn alerted by the National Weather Service, of uh, tornado conditions. And when that happens, we have to disperse uh, people around various parts of our district, as do other departments also, uh, to literally watch the sky and, and report on the, on the weather conditions. So we can try to s uh, spot any tornadoes, pick up the direction of the, 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 the uh, storm uh, so we can pass down, use our storms come from west to east. So we're looking to hear what Stoddard's going to tell us about what, what the weather condition is, and then Vroca's going to tell us. And, so we're waiting to hear what's going to happen to us so we can pass on to Hillsboro and on it goes. How challenging is it for you guys to get volunteers for the fire department? We have, uh, we have a 30-member 30, uh, 30 department. Uh, that's our cap. And we have been at full roster for 20 or 25 years probably. We uh, keep a waiting list. In fact, just last night we took on a new member who had waited one year to, to get on. So we're very fortunate uh, in the sense that we uh, have, have a real good uh, recruitment and retention, retention program. For a lot of departments, it, uh, it seems to be more challenging than it is for us. Uh, some of the other departments uh, have a little more trouble staying up to, uh, up to full speed. I think part of the reason for our success is just that we got uh, a little more employment right in the, uh, in the area that uh, enables people to uh, be more involved just heard on the radio this morning about there's been a reduction in people graduating in the paramedic program and that Tri-State was talking about how that is going to put a tax on their ability to respond to um, age, some transports but also just to other areas like to assist. Do you think that's going to impact you guys? Well it is it is to some degree we obviously uh, can uh, um, rely on mutual aid um, but you know, taking a longer view of that, uh, we have an aging population. Uh, and so the strain we're seeing on the EMS, uh, emergency medical services, is going to increase because we're going to see older people who get sicker oftener and need more transport. So if you project this out, say, 20 years, the, the demands on EMS are going to be uh, considerably greater than they are right now. And most people don't understand that uh, now our fire department does not run EMS. Uh, we have an ambulance service and a fire department, and they're two separate organizations, although we have a lot of crossover, a lot of members of both. Um, but uh, most people don't realize that your EMS calls are about five times what your fire calls are. Uh, so when people talk about a fire department, if it's a fire department that runs EMS, people are not understanding that most of the time a rig goes out the door, it's not a fire engine. It's an ambulance. So what calls does the fire department take? I know you said some accidents. We'll have um, storm spotting. We'll have any kind of structural fire call, any kind of hazardous materials call. We'll have uh, search and rescue, um, the child that has wandered away, uh, a, a confused adult perhaps, that, uh, and we've had that happen, wandered away in the winter or something like that. Um, accidents, obviously. Um, and just about anything else, you know, if you stop and think about it, who does the public call when they've got a problem and they don't know who else to call? They call the fire department. So invariably, there's, you know, there, there are calls that just don't really seem to fit any real, uh, uh, real category. And how do those calls come in? So is it generally the sheriff's department that's getting those calls and then calling? That's correct. All of our dispatching is done through the Vernon County Sheriff's Department, as, as, is, uh, as are all the fire and EMS organizations in the uh, in the county. And how does mutual aid work in terms of, are you guys taking a lot of calls? Do you have a service area that you 
What we have is something called a MABUS system. It stands for Man pardon me, Mutual Aid Box Alarm System. And it's a fairly well-refined mutual aid system that actually covers the north half of Illinois and the major portion of Wisconsin. And it um, is a system that defines what your resources are and how you will make your requests. So in other words, if we have a call and I know I'm going to need um, what we call tenders, or trucks that haul water to the sink because it's a rural scene, we already have set up who will be responding, who will be the responding departments. With the, that information is on file with the, with the dispatch. So I can say uh, I'll need a box alarm for tenders. And the dispatch knows what part of our district we're going to. It then will look at these cards. It will see what departments are then going to be called to send that resource. So these are pre-planned according to the type of response. If it's a, a request for uh, tenders, or if it's a request for personnel, say in a hydranted area, or if it's a wildland call or a structural call, um, these are pre-planned as to what resources are gonna get, get uh, dispersed. And, and it's scalable so that, uh, you know, when you have an enormous fire like they did at the Cudahy plant down uh, uh, in southern Wisconsin a few years ago, I mean, they had departments coming from two or three states. Uh, responding to that call. So how long does a call take once it hits Vernon County Dispatch? How long, if it's a structural fire, let's say, does it take you guys to respond? What's that process look like? Our first raid will usually go out the door in about five minutes. Uh, and that's five minutes from the time of, of our receiving the page. So the dispatcher will get the 911 call. We'll put out the page in just a, a matter of seconds. We'll receive the page, and uh, for that time we have to get dressed or leave our office or whatever it is we're doing, uh, get to the station, get our gear on, get our rigs ready, and out the door. Uh, usually we can have the first, uh, first rig out the door in, in five minutes, uh, which, is, which is a pretty respectable response time. The downside, of course, is uh, because of the area we live, you may have a 15 or even 20 minute travel time uh, to get there. So it's, um, you're still nearly a half an hour uh, post-call by the time you're actually on scene. So that can be very challenging. And how many people do you normally, do you have a set amount of rigs that go out or a set amount of people that you have, that, or is it just whoever can come at that time goes out? We, have, we will send whoever comes, but we'll have a set uh, assignment of vehicles. So the structure fire, for instance, a structure fire will send at least uh, an engine, uh, a squad vehicle, which will be used as a command vehicle, and also will carry people to uh, get into their SCBA so they can get uh, uh, scotted up to get in, um, and uh, at least two water tenders. Uh, if it comes in as a structural call, immediately as soon as we receive the call, we'll put out the mutual aid call, so we'll have departments responding, other departments responding also. But has there been anything that you feel like has been pretty incredible for our area or something that's impacted you? Yeah, there, there are calls that, uh, that you remember or, or that, that stay with you longer. Um, one of them was a, uh, was a semi rollover. And what you can't see in that, uh, in that uh, upside down semi in that crushed cab is there's a driver in there. And, and we're, we're working to cut him out of there. Uh, and, and the clock is ticking and it's, that's heavy equipment. And so it's, it's really, really hard to cut through it and bend it and move it without hurting someone. And uh, we did, we were successful getting him out. He survived, it was a very successful rescue. But there was a point there uh, when I was thinking to myself, and what happens if we can't get him out? Uh, so, you know, those kinds of things do, uh, do stick in your mind. So how do you recharge yourself from that? How do you leave something like that and then come back the next day re-energized? We're usually pretty careful to debrief, particularly if we have stressful calls. Uh, we'll do an informal debriefing, usually just uh, sitting around the station we get back, uh, very informally, just kind of talking about how things went and what, uh, what we might have changed or whatever. If, uh, if it's a more stressful call, say a uh, call where uh, there's multiple deaths or 
uh, a death of someone related to someone in the department or some, something that's made the, uh, the call particularly stressful. Uh, we may actually do a critical incident uh, stress debriefing after that. I draw my strength from the other people, uh, just as they do from me. Uh, we're taught to watch each other. You know, to, you know, is, your, is your buddy acting normally? You know, is it, after this last call, has he started drinking more? Uh, uh, is he not sleeping well? Is he edgy? Um, is there something going on here that you're noticing? So we're, we're taught to watch each other and, and draw our strength from each other. And so that's how I get recharged. Is, is, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you start to slip, you know they're going to carry you. If you could say you have one passion, what is it? I like to facilitate people to be able to excel. It's, uh, I, I have a theory that everybody deserves their chance. And nothing makes me happier than uh, seeing someone, particularly someone who perhaps may not have initially shown leadership potential, uh, develop and, and become a leader. I, uh, I really, really enjoy being a facilitator. Do you feel like there have been people that you you remember that you are just pinnacles of that, of you being able to support and now have really excelled in something? I do, yes. I, I can think of several uh, that uh, initially, in a couple of instances I'm thinking of, uh, uh, my decision was, was not well received uh, generally. And uh, looking back now, it, it turned out to be wonderful success. Failures too, of course. Uh, everybody should have a chance means that maybe some people that aren't deserving of a chance get one too. Uh, so there are, yeah, there are failures and disappointments, but uh, it's, it's really, really fulfilling to me to see someone get opportunities like I've had. People have given me chances, and uh, I, I love to be able to return that. You have a long list of accomplishments. Do you have anything that you're striving for now that you feel like that would be the last thing you need in your... Uh, I don't feel, like to think of last. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not at last yet. Uh, but there are continuing things that, uh, that I'm doing that, that I'm really enjoying. Uh, one of the things that is particularly interesting right now is I am the uh, United States representative on an international fire uh, service organization uh, called Organización de Bomberos Americanos, Organization of American Firefighters. And it is a uh, firefighter organization that is predominantly uh, Latin American. And so I've been doing quite a bit of work in, in Central and South America uh, on uh, training, delivering, delivering some training down there, and uh, working with OBA uh, as we try to facilitate uh, international exchanges throughout Latin America of uh, training and hopefully maybe eventually also resources. So what does that training look like? How, how are you training them on process or on equipment? The uh, most recent one I gave was on uh, fire department safety officer. Uh, fire departments uh, are required to have safety officers and uh, there are standards. I haven't belonged to the organization that writes the standard called the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. And since I'm on the uh, committee that writes uh, NFPA 1521, the safety officer standard, I uh, was able to uh, then uh, deliver training on that standard, how you establish a safety officer program in your department, how it's administered, the records that need to be kept, the training that the safety officers need, and things of that nature. What do you see in Latin America versus here in terms of their fire departments? Uh, in terms of resources, uh, we were light years ahead in almost every instance. I remember being in a um, celebration in um, Asuncion, Paraguay, and uh, it was a nationwide celebration. I'm trying to think it was like the 35th anniversary of their fire service or something like that. But it was, uh, it was so touching because people came from all over the nation to uh, be part of this celebration and parade. And in the parade, uh, people come marching through and nearly all of them were in the same departments wearing different types of turnout gear. Uh, almost every piece of equipment was different. Some had right-hand uh, steering wheels, some had left-hand steering wheels. So it, was, it was very, very obvious that most of the uh, equipment, most of the uh, turnout gear that these folks were using was donated. It, was, it had come from all over the world. But they were the proudest people you will ever meet. You know, they had come from all the world to show off their equipment. How much time do you spend outside of the country working on that? Probably about um, four or five international trips a year. Uh, I'll, I'll, spend, I'll spend doing that, to, not all uh, to South America. Um, 
I have a speaking engagement coming up uh, uh, in Tokyo in a couple of months, one in, one in Buenos Aires, uh, that's part of OBA uh, later this fall, and then, uh, one in Edinburgh, Scotland um, in a couple of months also. So they're different organizations. What do you think is one of your greatest accomplishments, or um, a couple of them, if you think? I think basically being able to allow people to succeed. That's, that's what I take greatest pride in. Um, yeah, it's as simple as that. Uh, facilitating success for other people. You are a community leader just by what you do. Is there any other community involvement that you do beyond the fire department and law firm? And Yes, um, I'm on the, uh, right now, on the board of directors of the Bethel Home uh, and Services. So I do, uh, I do serve there. And I do some pro bono work for Kikwa Valley Reserve, Friends of Kikwa Valley Reserve, I should say, and some other organizations like that. Uh, also some various fire service organizations I do some pro bono work for. What are some principles by which you live, work, and volunteer your time? I have a feeling that we all owe something back to the community. Uh, the community supports us, it nurtures us, so the community is the reason we're successful. And I have a feeling that we owe something back to the community. And I don't care how you do it. You could do it as a Boy Scout leader, you could do it serving on the church board, you can do it you know, any number of ways. You can do it in, you know, in uh, government. Uh, but whatever you choose, I really think we all owe something back to the community that supports us. I am particularly fortunate in that I do my service to the community in the fire service. And the reason I'm so fortunate is because I've chosen a job where people say thank you. I feel sorry for people who, for instance, take on jobs in local government. I'm fond of saying that we get far better local government than we deserve. And I say that because your town chairman, your village board presidents, uh, and the side boards are paid very little. Uh, they're paid a pittance. Rarely does the phone ring when somebody calls up and said, I just called up to say, you're doing a fabulous job and I want to tell you thank you. The phone doesn't ring very often for that. But the phone rings a lot to say, I don't like it that you didn't plow my driveway. I don't like it that the pothole didn't get fixed. And so I say to them, my friends who are in those positions, you've got to be crazy. Who would take a job where you get paid practically nothing and your award is being criticized all the time? Uh, I've got a great job. People thank me for my community service all the time. I think I get the best end of the bargain. Um, what are some of the biggest obstacles that you've had to success and how did you overcome them? I think the biggest obstacle anywhere that I ever find a success is negative people. Uh, a friend of mine once told me a, a great line. She said, avoid toxic people. They will bring you down. And I've, I've carried that thought with me because it's, it's absolutely correct. Um, negative people are, are, I think, the most difficult challenge. And what I've learned over the years is simply, you have to learn how to manage around them. What about plans for the near future? What have you got coming up in the next six months? Well, um, as I say, I have a speaking engagement in Tokyo uh, uh, coming up uh, in a few months uh, where I'll be speaking basically about um, uh, recruitment and retention in the volunteer fire service. And we'll have various other countries there talking about how they're meeting those same challenges. Then I have uh, the Organización de Bomberos Americanos meeting in Buenos Aires. Uh, that's an annual board meeting that we'll be having there where we'll be updating on, on uh, the programs we're developing. And then I um, also happen to be the uh, president of the U.S. branch of the Institution of Fire Engineers, which is an international fire service organization. We've got uh, branches in about 40 different countries. Uh, we are UK-based and we are celebrating actually our 100th anniversary this year. We were uh, founded in 1918. And so uh, uh, in 2018, the fall of 2018, our anniversary, we were meeting in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, where, our, uh, where our founding was, to celebrate our 100th anniversary. So I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful opportunities, uh, wonderful networking, and uh, just a, a marvelous opportunity. I, I'm, I am so blessed that so many people have given me opportunities to do exciting things.